This Sunday, spring has sprung and the Vermont State Park System is ready to celebrate. We want to be sure we're doing all we can now to make sure the park system is well set up for another 100 years and the future generations of park visitors. The park's hitting 100 years. How you can play a key part in the anniversary. Plus, the sound of jazz returns. Fast forward a few months later, the guys, um, the Flynn called me to ask me to curate, and it was, it, I was mentally prepared for it. I was so excited. This year's curator for the Burlington Discover Jazz Festival shares why she's so excited to be part of this year's event. And tackling the mental health crisis for kids with someone to talk to. We are, um, I want to say, epidemic levels of mental health crisis for youth. How a local nonprofit is ready to deliver a new program to help our youngest generation navigate the ups and downs. It's all next on NBC5 In Depth. Good Sunday morning. Welcome to NBC5 In Depth. I'm Brian Collar and welcome to the month of May, where in just a few weeks, the Vermont State Park System will open their gates for the season, celebrating their 100th anniversary. This past week, all the park managers gathered for their annual meeting at Bolton Valley for three days of training before they start welcoming guests. It's where we had the chance to sit down with the director of the Vermont State Parks, Nate McKean. 100th anniversary, that's yes. a big deal. Yeah, like I said, we, we have folks that come from all over the country to help us manage our parks, and the new folks this year are really um, joining us on a pretty amazing year, 100, 100 years at Vermont State Parks. This is our 100th season, and uh, it's gonna be a special year. I'm pretty sure it's gonna be hot and sunny, and uh, we're, we're doing a, a number of different things to promote the 100th, mainly, uh, you know, looking back on uh, how we got here and the importance that Vermont State Parks play uh, mm -hmm. uh, to Vermont and to Vermonters, uh, helping, um, you know, reach out to state visitors to raise awareness about Vermont State Parks. Um, but mainly we want to be looking ahead and we want to be sure we're doing all we can now to make sure the park system is well set up for another 100 years and yeah. the future generations of park visitors. So uh, one of the things that we're doing, um, we are encouraging folks to submit their stories about what Vermont State Parks mean to them. And uh, any, anytime you visit a state park, you're liable to come up with a story or, or a memorable uh, event that, that you'll be telling. And we want to hear about those. And that'll help us inform um, how we plan ahead for what's important to people. And you can uh, access the landing page for those comments on our, on our webpage. Um, at uh, uh, Vermont State Park's 100th anniversary. Yeah, you call this a pivotal moment in, in the state park system, why is that? Well, it's uh, 100 years and um, it's been quite a process to get here. We started out as one park in 1924, Mount Pilot State Park. And looking ahead, the, um, the value of state parks mm -hmm. and what folks get out of visiting state parks um, is just exp expanding. Um, there are more and more demands on mm -hmm. public lands mm -hmm. and uh, what folks want to do on public lands. So we really want to be sure that we're well set up making sure the parks are accessible to everybody, uh, yeah. not just the folks who grew up on the parks, but the folks who don't really have state parks on their radar right now. Uh, or haven't uh, growing up. And then our infrastructure, we have uh, quite an extensive infrastructure mm -hmm. um, you know, that's important for managing the parks. And we want to be sure we're planning ahead and converting that infrastructure to make sure it's um, going to be usable for the next 50 years and also uh, accessible. So folks uh, are fully up to date on ADA standards. and. Yeah. Uh, um, accessibility is a big part of our future. Yeah, what are what are folks going to notice as they head back to the parks this summer? Because it looks like you, you got some construction projects. I know I drove past the sandbar just yeah. a couple weeks ago. Yeah, sandbar is transformed. That's a, a park that a lot of people drive by, mm -hmm. and it's really important to Burlington, the city of Burlington, when the Burlington parks are having um, water quality challenges, and it's a short drive from Burlington and. We've revamped the entrance, mm -hmm. moved the entire entrance to make it a safer, more welcoming entrance and uh, better parking. And we've um, 
switched out some water lines and just the circulation of the park. So that's a huge change. Um, we had a lot of flood events from last July that we recovered from. Camp Plymouth State Park in uh, Plymouth is one of our top day use parks. It's a gem of a park and uh, that did not reopen after it was flooded the last year and we'll be re reopening that on Memorial Day weekend. So we're excited about that. Um, there are a number of other smaller construction projects going on. We have a new shop facility, maintenance facility being built in, in Killington, mm -hmm. at Gibbon Woods uh, State Park. So that's a huge undertaking. So uh, yeah, there's a lot going on. And uh, I think most of what people can expect every year is uh, our staff. And, and that's one of the reasons why we're here today at Bolton Valley, Valley because we understand we're in the service business and our folks are just top notch at welcoming people and keeping the parks um, clean and, and uh, welcoming. What's the most important message to people as they, as they plan ahead, as they look to make plans to go to the state parks this summer and into the fall? We have a spot for you, uh, definitely. And if your favorite site, campsite for example, isn't available, uh, there, are, there are other parks and other campsites that I'm pretty sure you'll enjoy just as much, even though we all have our favorite parks and our favorite campsites. Um, and camping, folks do like to plan ahead with camping, but you know, depending on the weather and the events, we have a lot of events planned for the 100th anniversary. Uh, we end up getting some last minute campers too. We have 2,200 campsites in Vermont, which is more than many other states, even yeah. though Vermont is so small. Uh, so it's quite a legacy and uh, we consider them outdoor hotel rooms and uh, we can find a spot for you. Are the parks as popular as ever, given the, the uptick in your numbers the last couple of years here? Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, really, outdoor recreation in general and state parks are more popular than ever. We are um, experiencing much more uh, attendance than we did, say, 10 years ago. Mm -hmm. And I think in the last eight years, our attendance has increased about 40% with a dip during COVID. Um, but and we had a record year in 2022, uh, yeah, two years ago, um, which was phenomenal. And we were very conservative in the way we count visitors. We really uh, only count the folks who come through our gates and register. Many more people are welcome to use our parks and mm -hmm. to use our parks in the off season or um, you know, uh, other parts of the year. Um, so we're more popular than, than ever, and outdoor recreation is more important than ever. And lastly, um, as, as people head to the parks, your advice to them would be, you know, um, appreciate what they have, make sure they, when they use the park, take care of the park. Yeah, of course, you know, we want um, everybody to have a great experience at the parks, and most folks, uh, folks come for many different reasons, but you just want to be sure you're having a great time while not impacting the other folks in the park. And uh, just be patient and, and soak up the, uh, the beauty of the parks, and if you need help, call us. The staff is always there to, to help out, but uh, the, one of the really nice things about uh, state, the state park experience is the communities that are built. Yeah. Many of our, our campers come back every year the same week and they, they're like old friends with other campers and they're looper right. in the park and uh, they really get to know each other. And the park community I think is so special because you have people from all over the country, all over the state, different backgrounds, some folks might have a huge RV, other folks might be in a tent, but it's the same type of, everybody's there for the same reason. Same reason, yeah. yeah. For more information on the 100th anniversary, sharing your stories and getting a seasonal pass, you can visit the park's website. We are just a month away from one of the biggest events our region plays host to, certainly the biggest music event. The Burlington Discover Jazz Festival will take place June 5th through the 9th, and this year the event has a new curator. French Caribbean soul funk R&B artist and producer Addie Oasis. She stopped by our studio this week to talk about her excitement in putting together this year's lineup. Addie Oasis, thanks for joining us this morning on NBC5 In Depth. Thanks so much for having me. How did this come about as far as the Burlington Discover Jazz Festival? Well, I, I will say, I think I probably manifested it last year before I even got the call. I, I toured a lot last year and I played, um, I was lucky to play a lot of jazz festivals. I mm -hmm. played Newport Jazz, Montreux, 
Montreal Jazz Fest, North Sea. Um, and every day that I played, I was kind of uh, playing with my band about imagining what our lineup would be. Right. What would be my dream lineup? Who would I have <laughs> on this festival? Uh, fast forward a few months later, the guys, um, the Flynn called me to ask me to curate. And it was, it, I was mentally prepared for it. I was so excited. So it wasn't a tough decision when you got that phone call to it be was the a curator. yes. It yeah, was a quick it was decision. Very quick decision, and it was something I have been dreaming of doing for a long time. Now, what does it entail? Obviously, you'd like it to be representative of your type of music, mm -hmm. empowering women, yeah. um, recruiting artists to come up here. Is, yeah. Has that been difficult? It hasn't. It, it's been uh, the the hardest part is how to organize it, and, mm -hmm. and it's been actually great for me as an artist to, to step behind the curtain and see what goes, you know, how it works, like right. how festivals are put together. Um, and it's, it's just really been like just playing around with making my dream lineup come to life. What's been the biggest surprise in putting this lineup together? Has there, any, has there been anything that, oh, I didn't know I had to do that, or you know, um, this is tougher than I thought it might be? Hmm. The biggest surprise, uh, dealing with agents. <laughs> and you know what? It made me realize how amazing my agent is. <laughs> I'm sure they're glad to hear that. Yeah. Um, how would you describe the theme of this year's Jazz Festival? Because it seems like every year there is a, a certain theme. What's, what's the theme going to be this year with you as the curator? I think I would say uh, futuristic inclusiveness. You know, we're, we're looking at the future of jazz. Um, it's about looking forward. It's about honoring the people that are um, part of the music industry and under the jazz umbrella, whether it's reaching out towards, um, I mean, branching out in other genres, mm -hmm. but also um, making sure that women are represented, making sure that women of color are represented, mm -hmm. LGBTQ artists are re represented, and also artists that are not necessarily from the United States and other languages. So really, you know, um, reaching out to as many, as many people as possible. All of those themes seem to describe your music yeah. in a way, right? Yeah, diversity. I yeah. guess I am kind of a, a melting pot within one person, and uh, I'm, I'm lucky enough that you know to be able to reach out to people that represent all of the, these things that are important to me. As we sit down here, you've just returned to the United States, yeah. and you've been all over. You've been to Europe, and before that, South America, yeah. and before that, the West Coast. Yeah. So how is it you're able to do all of that and this, it's got to be, and, and to be a new mom, it's got to be Coffee. a real balancing act. Uh, you know, it's it's really the balance. It's it's about being organized, it's about being supported, you know, having a great have a great team, um, and you know, it's it's I'm lucky to do what I love. So it's it's a job, and I like to 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 speak on it as a as a reminder that artists are people that go to work and and do a job, mm -hmm. um, and that that is how I approach it. You, sp you speak about the love of jazz. When did you realize that you had, at what age did you realize that you, you had a love for jazz music? Oh, I mean, I grew up with music. I started singing when I was two years old. And um, I guess when I was a teenager, in my late teenage years, I started to really learn jazz standards and, and study jazz. And um, really when I realized at that time that it was present in all modern day music, mm -hmm. um, it made me appreciate it even more. And what would you like the folks who are thinking about buying tickets to any of the events and marking their calendars for early June, what do you, what's the message to them as far as this year's jazz festival is concerned? My goal when um, creating this lineup was to leave people waking up the next morning reminiscing on something they've seen the night before. Mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's about um, you know, hearing music that you love, but also watching a show that, you, that leaves you dreaming. So that's, that's, that's what I would, would like to tell them. <laughs> Addie, thanks for joining us this morning. Thank you, thank you. Addie will also be playing during the festival, taking the stage on Friday, June 7th on the Burlington Waterfront. May is Mental Health Awareness Month. There's a new resource being made available to hundreds of Vermont kids as they deal with their ups and their downs. We're going to tell you about that when we come back.
I feel bad about this. This is the first time I have ever felt bad about a vote. Tension in Montpelier as lawmakers had to vote on Zoe Saunders, the governor's pick for Vermont's next education secretary. And after weeks of discussions and debates, Senate lawmakers rejected her in a 19 to 9 vote this week. Saunders comes from Florida, where her experience included work with charter schools. That has drawn a lot of criticism. Lawmakers concerned with work that she's not ready to handle in Vermont's system of public schools. Others, on the other hand, disagree. Because the brevity of time that she spent in public education did not resonate with what I expected of a candidate for the most critical public education leadership role that we have in our state. And personally, I have never witnessed in my 14 years in this building such character attacks towards what I consider a very, very good person. Governor Phil Scott has already appointed Saunders as the interim education secretary. After this week's vote, the governor said he was proud of how she has handled attacks from lawmakers and still believes she's the right person for the job. May is Mental Health Awareness Month. Recently, the nonprofit Mentor Vermont announced a new pilot program to tackle some unaddressed mental health needs of kids right now, especially after the pandemic. This morning, we sit down with two specialists who are working with this new program. Well, good morning to you both. Alexa Tashiro is with the Spectrum Youth and Family Services, and Jen Coleman is a psychotherapist specializing working with children and adolescents. Thanks for both being here this morning on NBC5 In Depth. Uh, Alexa, let's start with you. For the viewers who don't know what Mentor Vermont does, what do they do? Yeah, so Mentor Vermont is a statewide nonprofit that gives a lot of support and resources to mentoring programs like the one I work at. And you all are starting a new pilot program, Youth Mentoring Mental Health Support. Um, Mentor Vermont obviously saw a need. How will this work? So what we've learned is that, you know, there's a, it's a natural way to bridge the gap between mentors and the mentoring relationship and clinical mental health services. So while mentors are not mental health providers, they mm -hmm. are trusted adults in these children's lives and that can be used as a profound impact on their overall mental health. So with this pilot program, Jen, you'll be dealing with the mentors mm -hmm. who will then turn around learn whatever they can from you and take that back to the child who's having some type of mental health issue. Right, and, and again, it's more um, a supportive um, response to help the adults in these child, children's lives, um, and as well as the directors to kind of help guide them and navigate the mental health systems in Vermont, as well as providing some um, basic strategies that they can use in working with youth. Was this a big hole that needed to be filled? Massive hole. Yeah. 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 And why is that? Um, I think we all know that youth mental health has been a big challenge and um, this provides an opportunity for Vermont and Mentor Vermont specifically to really help bridge that gap and help youth um, and meet them where they're at mm -hmm. too because these mentors are going to the youth, they're going to the schools, they're in after-school programs where these kids are already at. Right. And that is really, really important. So you're meeting them where they're located. It's almost like a big brother, big sister type of relationship between these adults and the kids. Is that fair to say? It definitely can be. Yeah. I think it also depends on the program. So the program that I work at is community-based. We mm -hmm. don't have a specific location for mentors and mentees to meet. And a lot of these mentees aren't regularly going to school. They're really isolated, not leaving their home, sometimes not even leaving their bedroom. And so the mentor really is the one unpaid caring adult that they are contacting outside of the home and so having Jen there to support these mentors in supporting these youth in reaching out getting out of that space um, has been really invaluable. What are the signs that parents should be looking out for that my child needs some type of 
I wouldn't say intervention, but some type sure. of help, someone to talk to, some some type of expert in this in this type of situation. Yeah, I think isolation um, is a big one. If if youth are uh, isolating themselves from family and friends and, and even activities that they once loved to do, if they are not participating in those anymore, that's a huge red flag. I also think changes in sleep and eating habits are um, also big indicators. And if parents see those signs, how do they get their child involved with Mentor Vermont? So Mentor Vermont's website does have a mentor connector. Uh, you can put in your information and your zip code and it will give you a list of programs in your area. Okay. Um, do you have to be an active member of Mentor Vermont or in order to get these services, in order to be part of the, the pilot program that no. is starting now? Well, yes, I believe you do. Like there has to be, and Mentor Vermont is the kind of the overarching organization. Um, that all mentoring programs work with. Mm -hmm. And so I am working directly with Mentor Vermont, thus all the mentoring programs. It's a pilot program, which yes. means it's, um, it's on for a certain amount of time. How do you gauge the success of this program? What, what will you need to see in order for it to continue past whatever the time frame is that it's being given? I think that it's a matter of looking at the numbers, right? Everybody likes to see the data. Um, right. And the data, re I think, reflects in, is reflected in how many mentors are participating in, you know, communicating with me, right. reaching out. I do um, monthly, multiple times a month, um, what we're calling office hours, mm -hmm. where we do Zooms. And this is where an opportunity where mentors can bring any topic that their mentee might be struggling with. Right. It's all confidential. Um, no names are given. And it's just a way to kind of have a discussion about what's going on. Right. Um, you, you both deal with children. Um, where are we at with kids and their mental health coming out of this pandemic? <laughs> I know that's, that's a loaded a question. question, but yeah. it's, a it's a tough one, right? Where, where are we at? It's rough. Yeah. It's really difficult. Kids are struggling. It's, I'm not going to sugarcoat that. No. We are, um, I want to say, epidemic levels of mental health crisis for youth. Right. Um, and that's nationwide. That's not just in Vermont either. Right. Correct. Yeah. So how are we tackling it? I think programs like this, right. these types of programs, we're thinking outside the box here. This is very unique. Mm -hmm. Like we said, it's pilot. It's going extremely well. Yeah. And, you know, I think that these are the kinds of things that in Vermont, because we are Vermont, we can do. We can be flexible and we can use our community and our networks to really build a different system or in addition to the systems we have. If anyone sees this segment this morning and feels like they can help, how can they, how can they reach out to Mentor Vermont? Sure, so that Mentor Connector on Mentor Vermont's website, uh, which is mentorvermont.org, is really the best way to find what is closest to their area, mm -hmm. um, but also reaching out to local schools. There's a lot of school-based programs, uh, Spectrum Mentoring, where I work, has multiple programs and multiple ways to volunteer. And this, you know, this kind of started organically through King Street Youth Center, mm -hmm. and the work that I was kind of um, assisting with there mm -hmm. um, and you know so those are some of the really important organizations in our community that are doing fantastic work with children and adolescents today well thank you both for being here this morning thank you thank you very much if you'd like to learn more about the program and the services that mentor vermont provides you can check out their website at mentorvt.org we'll be right back to share some good news about us that's next
Before we go, a little news about us this morning. Liz Streppa has officially been named NBC5's new evening weekday anchor. She'll be joining myself and Tyler Jankowski on the news at 5, 6, 10, and 11. Liz has been with the station since the spring of 2015, working her way up as a reporter to the anchor desk, and we could not be happier for Liz. She will continue on the news at 4 and 5.30 with Jack Thurston until we find a replacement. That's all we have for this Sunday. Thanks for spending some of your morning with us. We hope you enjoy the rest of your day.